you know, I always want to say blast off after Chris has done the five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> yeah. Hey, thank you, Chris. And we're are back again um, in our study as we continue the book of Exodus. One of the things I enjoy doing on a, on a Friday evening when I'm relaxing is reading from a book of Jewish traditions called the Sayings of the Fathers. And this is part of the Talmud but it has the sayings of some of the great patriarchs and teachers in Israel. And I came across this one, and I wanted to share it with you. It, it really parallels the thought of Ezra 7, verse 10. It says, One should not teach the law to others, and himself not carry it out. Rather, let him first practice, and then teach others. As our sages of blessed memory said, speech is becoming only in the mouth of of those who practice what they preach. Boy, that's powerful. Ezra 7.10 uh, is, the, is the biblical uh, parallel to that. Practice what we preach. Well, we are looking at the subject of Passover tonight in chapter 12 of the book of Exodus. And I want to emphasize that Passover is the key to God's redemptive program. And it's through the Passover that God lays out a pattern for redemption that we will see in the person and work of Christ. So what we're studying in chapter 12 here in the book of Exodus is not just Old Testament um, tradition, it's really very theological, and it shows us how God is going to accomplish his redemptive work through a substitute, uh, through the death of a substitute, the Lamb of God. What we discover here in chapter 12 is that redemption of the firstborn Israelite is going to take place through the sacrifice of blood. And so God instructs the people of Israel that he is going to pass over the land of Egypt. And in every house, there is going to be the death of the firstborn son. This is the final judgment on the Egyptians who have refused to let the people go. But God says there's a way to redeem your firstborn son. And that is by sacrificing a lamb and taking the blood of that lamb and splattering it on the lintel and the doorposts of the house. And then God says, I will pass over you and no plague will fall on you when I strike the land of Egypt. The blood, he says in verse 13, is going to be a sign. A sign of what? What is the blood a sign of? The blood is a sign of the faith of the people who have applied what God said to their, their practice. They have done what God has, has said, and they have killed the lamb that takes the place of their firstborn. The blood represents the death of the lamb, who is the substitute for the firstborn son in the house. Now, you might say, well, this is, sounds kind of like a work salvation, kill a lamb and put the blood on the house. But actually, it's faith that leads the Israelites to do this rather strange ritual. Why would you do it? Well, God said to do it. Well, is it going to work? I don't know, but God said it, and I believe it. And so the Israelites who believed in the provision God had made for the redemption of the firstborn son did what he said. And he uh, killed the lamb, uh, they ate the lamb, they put the blood on the doorpost and on the lentil of the house. And we see in chapter 12, verse 13, God says, When I see the blood, I will pass over you. The blood represents the faith that is it's placed in God's provision of the substitute, the lamb that will take the place of the firstborn. Notice the word in, uh, in verse 13 of chapter 12, I will pass over. That's the name of this ritual, this tradition, pass over. God will pass over the places, the houses, the Hebrew houses, where the blood had been applied. So what we find going on here is a substitute who takes, who dies for the firstborn son. The firstborn son are going to die, but God says, <clears throat> for those who believe in my promise, I will allow the blood of an animal to take the place of the firstborn. So that's God's provision. And this is going to be the, <clears throat> the tradition that is practiced by the Jews in remembrance of how what God did in Egypt at the first Passover. So even today, Jewish people celebrate a Passover in commemoration of the first Passover. And they don't put the blood on the doorpost and on the lentil of the house. 
but they have a Passover ritual that recalls this first Passover, and uh, most uh, Jewish people do eat lamb on this uh, feast of Passover. Chapter 12 tells of the Passover feast. It also tells of the instructions concerning unleavened bread. Now, leaven is sometimes seen as a symbol of evil. In this particular case, it's primarily a symbol of haste. It takes time to let the bread rise. My wife makes bread usually every other week or so, and when she does, she has to allow the time for the bread to rise. <clears throat> if she doesn't allow time for the bread to rise, it's going to be really compact and hard and uh, won't be light and fluffy. Well, the Israelites were going to have to leave Egypt that night, and they didn't have time to let the bread rise, so what they had is kind of like, uh, well, it's matzah. It's unleavened bread. It's kind of like a saltine cracker without the salt. If any of you have observed Passover, uh, from a Christian point of view, you've had matzah, but it's an unleavened bread. Try eating a saltine cracker without the salt. Pretty bland. Not very tasty at all. But that was what they ate uh, for the seven day for Passover and the seven days that would follow uh, Passover. This unleavened bread, the eating of unleavened bread, was a reminder of God's powerful deliverance in the Exodus and how God delivered them uh, through the Red Sea and brought them out of the land of Egypt. Chapter 13, uh, verse 9, he says, You shall observe, you shall serve, um, it shall serve, unleavened bread shall serve as a sign uh, to you and a reminder. Um, of the powerful hand of the Lord that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So this was a, a sign of God's powerful deliverance of his people. So Passover is in the spring of the year, uh, usually in March or April, <clears throat> and Passover is immediately followed by seven days in which the Jews eat unleavened bread. Passover commemorates the Passover lamb, unleavened bread commemorates their separation from Egypt, their hasty departure from Egypt. Now, as we think about Passover, there's a lot of theology here. And so just briefly, the theology of Passover, what Passover teaches us is that all are under the penalty of death. In the first Passover, it was the firstborn son. He was going to die unless a lamb was slain in his place. So we're all under the penalty of death. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. But God provides deliverance through the death of a substitute. In the Passover, the lamb took the place of the firstborn. In the death of Christ, he, the Son of God, takes our place on the cross. He dies in our place. He is the substitute for us. And we call this a substitutionary atonement, where there's atonement through a substitute. Jesus is the ultimate substitute for us. And then the application of blood, it's not a work, it reflects faith. It reflects the individual faith of the person who applies the blood. And so the people uh, in the Israelite home where the blood was applied came under the protection uh, of God's promise. And uh, they benefited from the, the faith they had uh, demonstrated by, by applying the blood. Ultimately, Jesus fulfills the symbolism of Passover. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, Paul writes, and he says, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, but with the unleavened bread of malice. The un, the, with, not with the leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Passover was always followed by unleavened bread, just as salvation is always followed by sanctification, separation from sin and ungodliness. And so these two go together, just like Passover is followed by separation from Egypt. So our salvation is followed by sanctification from the rule and reign of sin. So these two uh, go together. Regeneration and sanctification go hand in hand. One leads to the other. God doesn't save us and leave us to live a sinful life. He saves us and then begins to sanctify us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, can a Christian celebrate Passover? Uh, I can't see your hands, but uh, raise your hand in your, in your cohort group if you have celebrated a Passover 
as a Christian? My answer to that is yes, Passover is an opportunity to remember God's plan of redemption and how it's fulfilled in Christ. And uh, if you go on Amazon, you can find uh, Passover booklets that are designed for Christians. Help us to focus our attention on Jesus and how the Passover lamb symbolizes him. And the various traditions of Passover really point ultimately to Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. I've often celebrated Passover with my family and with my students, and it's just a wonderful tradition where you can see the symbolism of these Old Testament uh, events and how they point ultimately to Jesus. It's also a great time of fellowship and sharing as you sit around a Passover table and, and um, eat good food and sing songs and remember uh, the Passover lamb, Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. The Israelites finished their Passover, took their unleavened bread, and left Egypt. The date of their departure from Egypt is 14, um, uh, 1406, uh, 14, excuse me, 1446, 1446. Um, the fourth year of Solomon's reign was 966, according to 1 Kings 6.1. The Exodus took place 480 years earlier, so add 480 to 966, and that gives you the year 1446. This is the biblical, I underline that, the biblical date of the Exodus. There's a lot of folks that will date the Exodus later, uh, 1300 or so BC or 1250 BC, but uh, the biblical data is pretty clear, and so we can date the biblical, the, the biblical date of the Exodus, 1446 BC. The Israelites left Egypt and um, uh, headed toward Canaan, but we see they, they didn't go directly to Canaan. They went into the Sinai Peninsula. There are really two possible ways to get to Canaan. One is to go directly across the northern part of the Sinai Peninsula and go right into Canaan. Uh, the problem with that route is that they would have bumped right into the Canaanites living in the land. And they would have also had to fight their way through some uh, Egyptians that were living in the north of, of Sinai. So this would be a, a difficult route for people who were shepherds and uh, hadn't, hadn't become warriors. The other option was to go south, to go south into the Sinai and, uh, and uh, spend time at Mount Horeb where God had introduced himself to Moses through the burning bush. So that's the route that they're going to take. The text in chapter 13 verse 18 refers to, in Hebrew, Yom Suf. It's translated Red Sea, but it's not really the Red Sea, it's Yom Suf, the Sea of Reeds. This doesn't necessarily mean it's just a marshy body of water, um, but rather it was a sea that was surrounded by reeds uh, growing in the water, but it was deep enough to drown the whole Egyptian army. So they left the area of Goshen, crossed this large body of water that re resulted in the death of the, of the pursuing Egyptians, but, uh, and then headed south into the, into the Sinai Peninsula. The, the crossing of the Reed Sea was one of the great miracles of the Exodus. And we read about it in chapter 14, the crossing of the, of the Reed Sea. The Israelites had left Egypt, but Pharaoh had changed his mind and decided he didn't want to let these slaves go, and he came after them. And so Moses was fleeing, all of a sudden they came up to this big body of water and they wondered, you know, the Egyptians are behind us, they're closing in, the sea is in front of us, what are we going to do? And the people began to complain and uh, complain to Moses, and Moses brought the matter to the Lord, and the Lord told him to stretch out his staff, and the sea parted. Three great miracles were accomplished on that day. First, God provided protection for the Israelites by taking the cloud that was leading them and putting that behind them to provide a, a, a barrier between them and the pursuing Egyptians. And then he parted the sea for the Israelites, and then he closed the sea over on the Egyptians. Three great miracles took place on that day as they passed through the sea. And they passed through the sea, the text tells us, on dry ground. 
verse 22 of chapter 14. Israel went uh, through the midst of the sea on dry ground. Some people suggest they kind of waded through ankle-deep water, but the text tells us clearly it was on dry ground. I would imagine that they kicked up some dust as this two million people crossed uh, this body where the water had been. They didn't splash through the puddles. The text tells us it was on dry ground. And the significance of this of these miracles is evidenced in verse 31 of chapter 14. When Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, they feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. The miracles accomplished their, their purpose. They authenticated Moses as God's messenger and his message of deliverance. They saw the power of God. They believed in the Lord. Their faith was encouraged by this uh, great miracle that had taken place. Well, after God does uh, something really amazing for his people, they like to sing about it. And so that's what they did next. Chapter 15 records the song uh, of Moses. This, the Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song. And this is the song they sang after the great victory over the Egyptians. I will sing unto the Lord, for he is highly exalted. His horse, the horse and its rider, he has hurled into the sea. The Lord, Yahweh, is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Chapter 15, verse 2 is really the theme of this great song of deliverance. As the Israelites celebrated on the banks of the Red Sea, they uh, proclaimed that God was the Savior of the people. And, of course, that's what this book is all about. God is the Savior of his people. And this psalm, or this song, really highlights that important theme. And then notice verse 18 as well. Um, <clears throat> In verse 18, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. The Lord shall reign. He is not only the great Savior of, these, of his people, but he's the king of his people. There's a phrase in verse 11 that I, that I like to share. It says, who is like you among the gods? Remember all those thousands of gods of Egypt? <laughs> Was any of them a match for the greatness of the Lord? None were. They were all humiliated. They were all shamed. They were all demonstrated to be impotent by the power of God and the great plagues on Egypt. Who is like you among the gods? And the answer is nobody. Nobody is like the Lord. The Hebrew phrase, who is like you, is mika mocha. Say that with me. Mika mocha. Mika mocha. Kind of sounds like a Starbucks drink, doesn't it? Mika mocha. I'll have a mika mocha, mocha grande there. Um, well, uh, this is who is like you. Mika and there is nobody as great and grand and powerful as our Savior, the Lord. Well, they continued their journey south into the Sinai. And as they went through the Sinai, God gave them some tests along the way. Oftentimes in a, in a uh, academic situation or a college class, you have tests throughout the semester. Well, as they made their way through the wilderness, God tested them. This is mentioned in chapter 15, verse 25. The difficulties they encountered along the way were intended as tests for the people. And the tests were intended to, to help them grow, help them to uh, st become strong in their faith and to uh, develop in their spiritual life. The first test was the test of water. And we see this in chapter 15, uh, verses 22 through 27. And they grumbled because the water... Um, there at Mara was bitter. They couldn't drink it. This was a test. Are you going to trust the Lord? <laughs> he got you across the, the Reed Sea. Are you going to trust him to provide water? And he, he tested them. And uh, then he healed the waters to provide for them. The next test was a test concerning food. They were grumbling. The people were grumbling. And they said, we don't have anything to eat. We've run out of provisions. Was God, God going to deliver them from Egypt and from their bondage and let them starve? No. The Lord spoke through Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven. And God provided for his people with manna. The word manna in Hebrew literally means, What is it? Manna. Manna. What is it? <laughs> well, they ate, What is it? For 40 years in the wilderness, they ate manna. God provided for them. Sometimes it's helpful to have a review lesson. And we discover a review lesson in chapter 17, where once again they run out of water. And uh, God tells Moses to strike the rock, 
in verse 6, and water will come forth. And Moses obeyed, and water came forth. God provided water for them again. And then in chapter 17, we read of their first encounter with some opposition. They run into some desert Amalekites there, and uh, they have a great victory over the Amal Amalekites as uh, Moses raises up his hands, and as he raises up his hands in a in an attitude of petition, God delivers his people, and Joshua appears for the first time as, as commander of the Israelites. Joshua is the warrior who will later take over the leadership of the tribes, lead them into, into uh, Canaan, and Joshua is seen as a warrior there. And then in chapter 18, we see another uh, provision uh, for leaders. The people needed some leaders, and Moses just was too busy. To, to teach the people and to uh, judge the people and do everything. So uh, God instructs him um, to, through actually Jethro is the one who instructs him to get some help. And so they share the burden and uh, God provides some leadership uh, in addition to Moses. They finally arrive at Mount Sinai, Jebel Musa, as it's known today. Jebel Musa is Arabic, it means the Mount of Moses. And here in the foreground, at the foot of Mount Sinai, traditional Mount Sinai, is St. Catherine's Monastery, a monastery that's been there at least since 500 A.D. Uh, the present building here was built by the Emperor Justinian. And it was here at a mountain in the Sinai that God delivered the law to Israel. Whether it was this mountain or the one next to it or one little bit further north, we don't know but this is the traditional mountain associated with the giving of the law, the enactment of the Mosaic Covenant. A little bit about the historical setting of the giving of the law. In studying the Mosaic Covenant, and by that term Mosaic Covenant, I'm talking about the covenant that God entered into with Israel at Mount Sinai, where he said, Israel, if you obey these commandments, I will bless you. You do this, and I'll do this. And it was a uh, an agreement that God made with his people at Mount Sinai. In studying this Mosaic Covenant, we discover that God used a contemporary cultural institution to communicate his will to his people. You see, between the 15th and 13th centuries BC, there was in use an international treaty form, which outlined the relationship between a lord, or a suzerain, and his people, the vassals. So you've got the king and his people entering into a covenant relationship, the suzerain and the vassal. Copies of these treaties have been discovered and translated, and they are found to follow a regular pattern and have elements that are almost identical to what we have here in the book of Exodus. The covenants begin with the historical preparation, which corresponds to chapter 19, where we see the Israelites are called to the mountain, and uh, God is going to come down on the third day and uh, give them the law. And uh, all this preparation is made. The Lord says, uh, don't go near a woman during this time. You, you need to recognize uh, the importance of purity at this time. And, uh, and uh, he tells them, don't touch the mountain. This is a holy place. And so after that historical preparation, we have the preamble of the covenant. In chapter 20, verse 1, the Lord spoke, I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The preamble reminds us of what God has done for the subject people, for the vassal people. And what God has done, he's delivered you from the land of Egypt. He's delivered you from bondage. And it's on that basis that he expects certain behavior of you. God expects his people to obey him because he has delivered them. There's a mutual and reciprocal obligation here. God has done something for his people. Now they must obey and submit to him. <clears throat> we have the historical prologue, the, the basis for obedience to the, to the covenant. God says, here's what I've done for you. And then we have the stipulations of the covenant. And the basic stipulations are the legal policy to which the community agrees. They are the legal policy. And this, the legal policy is really summarized in what we call the Ten Commandments, the basic stipulations of the law, the covenant. And then we have the detailed stipulations, which is pretty much everything else, the legal procedures 
which are all designed to enforce the policy of the Ten Commandments. So you've got the summary and the basic stipulations, and then you have the detailed elaboration and everything that follows. But it all fits together. As we look at the basic stipulations of the covenant, we see that they are divided into two sections. First, the four first the first four statements are our responsibility to Yahweh, the great king, the suzerain, Israel's responsibility to God. And then the, the next six, commandments five through ten, are how to treat others, treatment of others. So first we see some responsibilities to God. Secondly, we see responsibilities to others. And so let's take a look at these commandments and just kind of think through the Big Ten as uh, we find them listed here. The first one says, you shall have no other king, no other ruler, no other god but one. You shall have no other gods before me. The Egyptians had lots of gods, but the Lord says to his people, just one. I don't want any competition. <laughs> I just want you to worship one God. One God and one God only. And then the second commandment, you shall not make yourself an idol or need a likeness of what is in heaven above or in earth beneath or in the water beneath. Don't make any idol or worship any idol. Don't make an image of God because if you make an image of God, you'll make that image after what you look like or what you think. It'll be a man-made image instead of truly what God is. And the fact is God doesn't have a physical form, a physical body. So don't make an image. Don't make an idol that you would worship and that would take God's place in your life. The third thing he says is don't use God's name inappropriately. Verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. We often think of of uh, taking God's name in vain, saying some kind of a swear in, in connection with God using his name in vain. But there's other ways we can use God's name in vain. When we use God's name, his holy name, Yahweh, without really thinking of its significance and what it means, using it just in a thoughtless way. Sometimes people will say, you know, I had a flat tire today, praise the Lord. You know, my cat got run over today by a truck. Praise the Lord. You know, that's really, are you really praising the Lord? The, the expression praise the Lord is a command to lift up the holy name of God in the presence of others so that he gets the glory and worship. And if we're using a reference, you know, praise the Lord, and not really thinking about the importance of it and what it means, we're using God's name in vain. Sometimes in prayers, people say, oh God, oh God, oh God, are you, really, are you really thinking about what you're saying? Are you really thinking about the Creator? Are you using His name in a way that honors Him or in an empty way? That's what this is all about. Don't use God's personal name, His holy name, in a foolish or, or careless way. It was on the basis of this verse that the Jewish people decided that they wouldn't use God's name at all. And so you find that Jewish people don't use the name Yahweh. They refer to God as the Holy One, or the name, Hashem, the name, or the Eternal. But in Jewish tradition, God's personal name, Yahweh, is not used. The next commandment, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Shabbat, the last day of the week, a day of rest. And so here it tells us to remember to rest and to be refreshed on this day, even as God worked for six days, creating the heavens and the earth, and then rested on the seventh day. I must confess, I have been a Sabbath breaker most of my life. I've uh, tried to reform, but uh, the temptation to work seven days a week is, is uh, one that I, I still struggle with. But God got my attention some years ago when I was uh, uh, doing some preaching, and I had come up to the seminary early on a Sunday morning to finish up some office work, uh, I had a sermon to preach later on that day about 10 o'clock, but I figured I had time to get some work done in the office. And then on the way home from the office, I was on my bicycle, rounded a corner, didn't realize there was a little spot of black ice out there, and my bicycle went out from under me, and I landed on my hip and broke my hip. That was 10 years ago. 
and God said, Carl, you need a day off. <laughs> Matter of fact, six weeks off. And that's what it ended up. I, I was out of the office and out of work uh, of teaching for six weeks as I recovered from that broken hip. Thankfully, I got a good surgery and uh, my hip has, has recovered. But I, I've been learning little by little to receive the gift that God gives us once a week. He gives us a gift. He gives you a gift. He gives me a gift. He gives us the gift of rest. We can reject the gift and work seven days a week. But you know, we don't get it back. That day is gone. And if we haven't received that day as a gift, that day, that day is gone forever. God says, I want, you to, I want you to receive my gift of rest, Shabbat, once a week. For many of us, uh, Sunday isn't really too much of a day of rest because we're preaching, we're teaching Sunday school, we're meeting with the church board. So there may be another day that would be more suitable. Uh, and perhaps Saturday is the best day to enjoy that day of rest and then start the new week with work, preaching and teaching God's Word. The next commandment moves from the commandments concerning God and remembering Him to commandments concerning the treatment of others. Your father and mother, honor them. Count them as valuable. Respect them as they grow older and uh, treat them with honor and dignity. Uh, you shall not murder, uh, verse 13. Uh, this upholds the sanctity of life, and uh, this would include uh, abortion and euthanasia and, and assisted suicide. Uh, don't take a, a human life. Now, uh, as I pointed out earlier, there is a difference between murder and killing. Killing is something that can be done uh, to animals. It can be done in warfare. It can be done through legal execution. But murder is different. Murder is the unwarranted taking of a human life in a, um, a non-just way. You shall not commit adultery. This upholds the sanctity of marriage and keeping the relationship of marriage pure and, uh, and upholding faithfulness in the marriage covenant. Verse 15, no stealing. This upholds the sanctity of personal property. Don't take what is mine. I won't take what is yours. We, we respect property rights and, uh, and personal property. Verse 16, no false witnesses. Don't say something that is untrue. Uh, don't witness against your neighbor something that is untrue. And finally, no coveting. Don't seek what you cannot have in a, in a rightful, legal way. Don't desire and seek what you can't have in a rightful and legal way. Well, these are the basic stipulations of the covenant. And then we find that the detailed uh, requirements follow. The detailed stipulations in chapter 20 um, through 23 expand on the basic stipulation and present the punishments and the examples and the applications of the Torah to life. So the rest of the commandments beyond the Big Ten are the detailed stipulations applying the covenant law to life. Now it's important to understand that the law was given as a contractual obligation. Mark those words, contractual obligation. God gave the law as a contractual obligation to a redeemed community to show them how to live in relationship with a holy God. It was a guideline. It was to guide them in their relationship with God. The law was never given as a means of salvation but rather it was given to a people who had experienced the exodus. They had placed uh, the blood of the Passover lamb on their doorpost by faith. They had come out from Egypt, and now they were a redeemed people. And God says, now here's how you live as a redeemed people with the Holy God. That God wasn't, what, what do we mean, a contract, a contractual obligation. The people of Israel entered into agreement. God said, do this. And I will do this. It was a mutually obligation in that treat in that treat in that agreement. The obligations of the contract are detailed in the Torah. Here's the, the Torah is really a contract between God and his people. But the contract ends when it's replaced by a new con contract, a new covenant. And so the, the new covenant is what we are under, not under the Mosaic covenant. The, co the law wasn't given. Um, uh, to us, it was given to Israel. We are under the new covenant, not the old covenant. But that raises a question. 
should we have anything to do with the law? Should we obey the law? I think it's important to realize that the law does have some underlying principles of morality that reflect the character of God. We see that the relationship that the people had with God preceded his giving of the law. They weren't saved by keeping the law. God saved them and then gave them his teaching. That's what the word law means, teaching. But here are some questions to ask. There are some laws that are specific for Israel, the laws of the sacrifice, the laws of the priesthood. These laws were fulfilled in Jesus and really have no relevance for us today in terms of practical application. But other laws are generally applicable, laws that, uh, that uh, reflect something of the character and the attributes of God. And here are some questions you might ask as you consider the law. Does the New Testament in any way nullify the Old Testament application? Well, certainly the law of sacrifice. We find that the Old Testament sacrifices have been fulfilled in Christ, and there is no longer any sacrifice of a lamb or a goat on the altar. Christ fulfills all that. The New Testament nullifies the law of sacrifice. Does the New Testament modify any of the Old Testament application? Well, the Old Testament said, you shall not commit adultery. Jesus taught, you shall not look on a woman for the purpose of lusting. I think Jesus is really giving us a divine insight into what the law, don't commit adultery, was all about. But he says, not only don't do adultery, don't lust after someone who's not your, your spouse. And then does the New Testament verify in the Old Testament application? And certainly we have Paul in, in uh, Romans chapter 13, uh, giving us some laws which come right from the Hebrew Bible. Don't steal. Don't, don't lie. Don't uh, um, uh, worship idols. And these come right from the Hebrew Bible. So we find there are laws that Paul repeats that are verified in the New Testament. So three questions to ask when you look at some of these laws from the Old Testament. Is it nullified by anything in the New Testament? Is it modified by anything in the New Testament? And does the New Testament verify or support some of these Old Testament laws? So those are good questions to ask. What would it be like to live in the time before slide projectors, overhead projectors, videotape, and all the technology that we enjoy today, including PowerPoint? What would I do without PowerPoint? <laughs> You'd be looking at a blank screen if it wasn't for PowerPoint, or maybe have to look at me while I, while I talk. Well, in the Old Testament period, they didn't have all this visual media, media, so God gave them something that would take the place of that. God gave them the tabernacle. He had promised way back in Genesis 9, verse 27, that he would dwell in the tents of Shem. God would dwell among his people. And in the tabernacle, we see God fulfills that promise. He comes down and dwells among his people in the tabernacle. What's it called? Well, it's called the mikdosh. The word means sanctuary in chapter 25, verse 8. It's called the mishkan, a word translated tabernacle or tent. It's also called oel, a tent, a portable, collapsible building. It's called the tent of meeting. And it's called the Tabernacle of Testimony, referring to the Ark of the Covenant that held the testimony, the tablets of testimony that God had given Moses. So these are different names that describe the tabernacle in, in different ways. As we consider the purpose of the tabernacle, we recognize that there was a historical purpose that was a place for worship, a place for offering sacrifices. But the tabernacle is also typical in that it points to the person and work of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> a type is an Old Testament illustration which is divinely appointed to foreshadow some New Testament truth. An Old Testament illustration that God has appointed in the Bible to foreshadow something about the person and work of Christ. So in the rest of this section of the book of Exodus, God reveals this tabernacle this portable, collapsible tent that was carried about through the wilderness, a places, place where the Israelites 
would worship and offer sacrifices. As we look at chapters 25 through 40, we see God first tells them what to build. He gives them the specifications of the tabernacle. And then he tells them how to worship. And here he reveals some of the tabernacle ritual. Chapters 35 through 39 tell us how the people of Israel obeyed God and constructed the tabernacle. And finally, in chapter 40, Moses records how God approved the tabernacle when it was erected by filling it with his glory. God filled the tabernacle with his glory. Well, where would the people get the materials to build the tabernacle? Moses directed, God directed Moses to invite the people to give an offering of the things they had taken from the Egyptians to build the tabernacle. <clears throat> and notice the, the motivation for this. Uh, it was to be given, chapter 25, verse 2, from every man whose heart moves him. Giving was to be done from willing hearts, not merely out of religious obligation. So the gold and the beautiful material and all the wood and, and copper was given by the people out of willing hearts, and God was pleased. He was delighted with these gifts for the tabernacle. The tabernacle included a courtyard where there was a bronze altar and a place for ritual washing, and also the tent, which had two rooms, the holy place and the most holy place. It was covered with curtains, and the whole tabernacle court was about 150 feet deep and 75 feet wide. And there was only one entrance into the court of the tabernacle. It reminds us of the fact that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes into the presence of God except through him. Only one entrance into the court of the tabernacle. As we go into the court of the tabernacle, the first thing we see before us is a bronze altar. This was a place of sacrifice. And it's called the, burnt, the altar of burnt offering because that's what happened there. The altar, right in the middle of the court of the tabernacle, points to the need for atonement. And it points us to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The blood of bulls and goats could never take away sins of the people. All of those sacrifices from the Old Testament period merely pointed ahead to the person and work of Christ and what he would accomplish on the cross. As we move on into the courtyard, we come to the laver. And the laver was there for the purpose of ritual cleansing. And the priests would wash themselves. They would wash their feet and their hands, not to get the dirt off, but they would wash for ritual purposes. And we see that the washing and uh, the use of the laver, laver typifies Christ's provision for cleansing from the defilement of sin. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to what? To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So not only do we need the altar of the burnt offering, we also need the laver for cleansing from sin. The wrath of God is satisfied by the sacrifice, but still there's cleansing that needs to be done from the defilement of sin, and God provides that for us in the work of Christ. And now we come to the tabernacle tent itself, 45 feet long, 15 feet high and wide, and divided into two basic rooms. It was covered by beautiful material, fine linen, the innermost material, then goat's hair, then ram skin, then some kind of a marine animal over the top to protect the tent from the desert winds, the structure from the desert winds. There's some debate as to whether that's dolphin skin or shark skin or whatever. But uh, it was an outer covering and protection. Uh, some have debated uh, as to whether the red signifies anything. Uh, some point to, to the blood of Christ. I'm not sure that we really have a biblical justification for that. But I think what we can appreciate is there was a lot of beauty associated with this tent. God takes pleasure in beauty. As we look inside, we see there's two rooms. There's the holy place and the most holy place. In the holy place, we find there are three items, a lampstand, a table for bread, and an altar for incense. 
Many of your Bibles will have some illustrations of the tabernacle. You can take a look at those or go online and you can see uh, illustrations of the tabernacle. But let's look at each of these articles of furniture. First, the table for showbread, as it's usually called, literally face bread. There were 12 loaves placed on the table, one loaf for each of the 12 tribes. And these loaves are typical of Jesus who said, I am the bread of life. John 6, verse 35. These loaves, representing the 12 tribes, remind us of Jesus, the bread of life. The lampstand provided light for the priest as they worked inside the dark tent of the tabernacle. And one also the lamp points to Christ. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So the lampstand points to Jesus, John 8, 12 and 9, verse 5. The altar of incense points to Christ's perpetual intercessory prayer in our behalf. Hebrews says he ever lives to make intercession for us. Hebrews 10, uh, Hebrews 7, verse 25. And then the veil represents the way of access into the presence of God and is typical of Jesus. In uh, Hebrews 10, verse 20, it mentions that the veil is Christ. The veil represents Christ. And with the tearing of the veil at the death of Christ, a new way of access was opened up into the very presence of God through what Christ had accomplished on the cross. Inside the, beyond the veil, is the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies. And the Ark of the Covenant was a box, and the lid on the box was referred to as the place of propitiation, where God's wrath on sin was satisfied. The place of propitiation on the Ark of the Covenant points us to the person and work of Christ and his atonement in our behalf. The Ark itself reminds us of God's presence among the people, and the place of propitiation points us to the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Paul writes in Romans 3 verse 25 that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. As we think about the tabernacle, there's a lot of theology here. God has promised to dwell among his people. We see that he's a holy God. There's cleansing that needs to be done before we come into his presence. And there needs to be a sacrifice for our sins. And Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. The blood of bulls, blood of bulls and goats could never ultimately satisfy God's wrath on sin, but they point to, the, to Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. Chapters 28 and 29 tell us of the priestly responsibilities. In the courtyard, they would burn, they, they, would, uh, they would take care of the, uh, the sacrifices um, in, the, in the courtyard. In the holy place, they would trim the lamps and uh, put the oil in the lamps. In the area of health, they were to inspect the people. If someone was suspected of leprosy, they would examine them and, and tell them what they needed to do. They also had responsibilities in the area of justice where they mediated difficult cases, kind of like a Supreme Court. And then they were also to instruct the people in the Torah. So they had responsibilities uh, that included more than just offering sacrifices. They taught, they mediated difficult cases, they had areas of responsibility in the area of health, and they worked in the tabernacle. The clothing of the priest uh, depicted here, they had kind of an outer apron over an inner robe, the blue robe. The outer apron is called the ephod, and on the ephod was the breastplate with 12 different stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Pretty clearly the priest represents the people of Israel before God. As we come to chapter 32, we see the breaking of the covenant that the people had just entered into at Mount Sinai. Three failures are noted here in chapter 32. A failure to recognize their exclusive allegiance to Yahweh. What did they do? They set up a golden calf. A failure to recognize that it was Yahweh who delivered them from Egypt. And a failure to rely on Moses, their covenant mediator. And the Israelites broke the covenant. It was a sad day when Moses came down from the mountain and saw the people dancing and singing around the golden calf. Uh, and uh, 
in, in response to the words of Aaron, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. They had broken the covenant, and this brought great grief to the heart of Moses. And he goes to the Lord and he prays, Lord, show me your glory. He's desperate to see God anew. The Hebrew word glory comes from the word to weigh or be weighty and speaks of God's glorious reputation. Moses needs to be reminded of God's glorious reputation in light of what has happened with the breaking of the covenant. And so God answers his prayer and reveals himself to Moses in Exodus 34, verses 6 through 8. And what is so unusual about this text, I'll let you discover that on your own, but there is something very unusual about this text. Most texts tell us about God. What does this text do? Well, God tells us about himself. God tells us that he's compassionate, that he's gracious, that he's long-suffering, that he's faithful, that he is a God of wrath. He must judge sin. But I'm impressed with the fact that God first tells us that he's compassionate. He doesn't say, I'm holy, or I'm sovereign, or I'm just. He says, I'm compassionate. The word compassion comes from the Hebrew word for womb and speaks of God as having a mother-like tender mercy and care for his people. God is like a mother who has great compassion for his people. God reveals himself, and then we see the people did what God told them to do, and they built the tabernacle, chapters 35 through 39. And uh, when they completed the work on the tabernacle, we read that a cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. Exodus 40, verse 34. God had revealed himself to his people. He'd come down and dwelt among his people in the tabernacle. And this was a great day of celebration for the people of Israel. And as we continue on in our study, we'll see how this tabernacle was with the people as they continued on in the wilderness and eventually came into the land of Canaan. And the tabernacle was there until it was captured by the Philistine and the ark taken. And then later on we find that David builds an altar and Solomon builds a temple. But I'm getting ahead of the story and need to conclude. May the Lord bless you tonight as you interact with one another with the study questions. And I hope you'll find them engaging and helpful. God bless you and have a wonderful evening.